So our Bible readings this morning from 2 Kings chapter 6 and then from Ephesians chapter 1. In 2 Kings 6 we're going to begin at verse 8. The king of Syria was at war with Israel. He consulted his officers and chose a place to set up his camp. But Elisha sent word to the king of Israel, warning him not to go near that place, because the Syrians were waiting in ambush there. So the king of Israel warned the people who lived in that place, and they were on guard. This happened several times. The Syrian king became greatly upset over this. He called in his officers and asked them, which of you is on the side of the king of Israel? One of them answered, no one is, your majesty. It's the prophet Elisha. He tells the king of Israel what you say, even in the privacy of your own room. Find out where he is, the king ordered, and I will capture him. When he was told that Elisha was in Dothan, he sent a large force there with horses and chariots. They reached the town at night and surrounded it. Early the next morning, Elisha's servant got up. He went out of the house and he saw the Syrian troops with the horses and chariots surrounding the town. He went back to Elisha and exclaimed, We are doomed. What shall we do? Don't be afraid, Elisha answered. We have more on our side than they have on theirs. Then he prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord answered his prayer. Elisha's servant looked up and saw the hillside covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. When the Syrians attacked, Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, strike these men blind. The Lord answered his prayer and struck them blind. Then Elisha went to them and said, you're on the wrong road. This isn't the town you're looking for. Follow me. I'll lead you to the man you're after. And he led them to Samaria. As soon as they entered the city, Elisha prayed, Lord, open their eyes and let them see. The Lord answered his prayer. He restored their sight and they saw that they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw the Syrians, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, sir? Shall I kill them? No, he answered. Not even the soldiers you had captured in combat would you put to death. Give them something to eat and drink and let them return to their king. So the king of Israel provided a great feast for them. And after they had eaten and drunk, he sent them back to the king of Syria. From then on, the Syrians stopped raiding the land of Israel. And then from the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1, and beginning at verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to God for you. I remember you in my prayers. And I ask the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the Spirit who will make you wise and who will reveal God to you so that you will know Him. I ask that your minds may be opened to see His light so that you will know what is the hope to which He has called you. How rich are the wonderful blessings He promises His people and how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This is the word of the Lord. When the temperature drops below zero, just for a day or two, and it may very soon, the end of the weather forecast will maybe offer this warning, do not go skating on the ice of the lake, it is too thin. But in some parts of the world, of course, it becomes so thick that it is perfectly safe to go skating on it, to enjoy the fun. 
It helps, perhaps, when we see others out there skating safely. It helps when a, a friend takes us by the hand and says, come on, it's okay. And eventually we try. We take that first cautious step out onto the lake. And we begin to gain in confidence. Or maybe not, we leave it to others. But when it comes to the life of faith, and when it comes to being ministers of grace, we should not be left standing at the edge of the lake. And so in our passage today, we see the confidence of Elisha's faith in God. And we see the way in which he encourages his servant to grow in faith. As it were, takes his servant by the hand onto the eye. And so let's begin by considering Elisha's confident faith in the Lord. Three times in 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha prays. Each time he begins with the words, O Lord. And three times the text tells us that the Lord answered his prayer. And I think we should note the frequent use of the name there, the Lord. It's, it's not an accident, it is quite deliberate. In this section that highlights Elisha's faith and the way that he builds up the faith of his servant, the name of the Lord is most appropriate. For this is the name of God that God revealed most fully to Moses. And that name of God speaks of the God who makes promises. The God who remembers those promises. The God who fulfills those promises. The one who is the faithful promise-keeping God. And therefore, the God who can be trusted. Well, where did Elisha get this faith from? The Bible tells us that faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. We don't know exactly how the Lord spoke to Elisha, but God certainly did. Which is why Elisha can frequently say to people, this is what the Lord is saying. Because Elisha listened. And the Bible has many examples of people who did that. Where did Noah get the faith to build a huge boat when there wasn't a cloud in the sky? Because he heard the voice of God. How come Abraham, at the age of 75, leaves the comforts of his home, begins a long journey, he doesn't know exactly where, and lives for the rest of his life in a tent? Because he was listening to God. How did Joshua get this idea that he'd walk around the city of Jericho and then go and sit down for the rest of the day? And then the second day, get up and go and do it again. And at the end of the week, go around several times. Because he heard the word of the Lord. Faith comes through hearing. And hearing the word of the Lord. Now, here sometimes we need to reckon with the fact that sometimes God may speak through what's called a prophetic word. That is, someone may have something to share, which they believe God has put upon their hearts for a person or for a, a congregation at a particular moment in time. And in all of that, we need a good balance between the written word of God and what's popularly termed a prophetic word of God. The Bible says, do not despise prophecies. So we should be willing to listen. Equally, at the same time, the Bible says, test every prophetic word. And the way that we test every prophetic word is by the written word of God. With the prophetic word, I think we need to be careful. What I mean is this. We mustn't go chasing those kind of words. You know, I've, I've had friends who have travelled hundreds of miles sometimes to go and listen to a very famous, popular preacher, hoping that that person would have a word directly for them. Now, I, 
I don't want to be unkind, but it, it just seems that receiving that kind of prophetic word is, is somehow rather spectacular, somehow rather exciting. And, and dare I suggest, somewhat easier than applying our minds to understanding the Scriptures. But when God, the Holy Spirit, opens up the written word to our minds and our hearts, isn't that exciting? Shouldn't that be something that stirs and, and moves us? We need a good and a right balance of the two. Because let me say, I do believe in the prophetic word. When we were in Sri Lanka, we had a, a pastor friend of ours who, when he was a, a young teenager, was given a word that he would one day become a pastor. Completely out of the blue to him. And so what he did was he went to Bible college for several years. He'd been serving in a church for a few years. And when we got to know him, he was serving as a good pastor. And we encouraged him to hold on to that prophetic word, particularly in the moments when being a pastor was tough. It happens. But always we need to be wise and careful. Certainly we need to come to the written word in order to hear God speaking to us. Now you might say, well, I don't often find reading the Bible easy at times. Well, you can always get hold of various sets of different Bible reading notes. There are a few at the back of the church. I've got a whole pile of them in my study and you're welcome to borrow one or other and see if that helps. They just offer some comments on a Bible reading day by day that help us to understand and to apply that word into our lives. If you're not part of a home group, then, then consider joining a home group. Because there you have that opportunity with a small group of others to read and to study God's word. And don't worry if you can't answer all the questions. None of us can. And don't worry if it seems that maybe one or two know rather more than you do. Just see that as an opportunity to learn together. Because within home group, nobody is going to be made to feel silly. It's a place to ask questions and to learn together. So that faith may grow as we hear the word of God. So, Elisha has this confident faith because he is listening for the word of God. And in Elisha's life, we see how his faith is a confident trust, both for God to provide and for God to protect. Elisha had seen God provide in, in so many ways. The restoring of the water in the well at Jericho. The oil from the widow's jar that just kept pouring until every bowl and dish and pot and glass and cup was full. Through a simple gift when a young man brought 20 loaves of bread. When the Shunammite woman's son was raised to life. Yes, Elisha knew that God could provide. He knew that God would provide. And so Elisha lived with that confident faith and trust in God. The same confidence that Paul has as he writes to the church in Philippi and promises them, my God shall supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And it's that confident faith with which God wants you and I to live. It's with that faith that God wants us to go out into the next week that lies ahead of us. Knowing that God can and will provide. Knowing also that we can trust God to protect us. Elisha knew the story of Jacob and how God had protected him on his long journey. He no doubt knew the story of the people of Israel in the years of the wilderness and how God had watched over them. He no doubt had read some of the Psalms of David and knew that when David was running from King Saul, God protected him. I don't doubt that Elisha would know Psalm 34. Praise from the cave is what it's sometimes called. David was on the run from Saul. He had gone to a Philistine village but found no safe place there and so he ran away from there until he found the cave at Adullam. And there he writes Psalm 34. 
psalm begins with a commitment to praise God. Remember here, David is on the run. David's life is under threat. David is in a, a, a tight corner. And yet he pledges day after day that he will in that time, in that difficulty, still praise God. And then he testifies that when he sought the Lord, the Lord heard him and delivered him from all of his fears. Not just the physical danger, but from the fears of those. Isn't it, isn't it sometimes the fear of what may or may not happen that is sometimes worse than whether it does or doesn't? Now, King David, who wrote that psalm, lived some 200 years before Elisha. And I think highly likely Elisha knew the psalm. And if he sang it, and if he meditated upon it, then Elisha would be hearing the word of the Lord. And that's how Elisha's faith is confident. Faith that God will provide, faith that God will protect him. His situation was different to David's, but the Lord was still the same. Elisha has this confident faith because he hears the word of the Lord. Elisha has this faith that God will provide and will protect. And Elisha has this faith that is strong because Elisha understood spiritual realities. When his servant got up in the morning and opened the door and saw hundreds of horses and chariots and, and soldiers all around the place where they were, the servant panics. But Elisha remains calm. Where the servant is afraid, Elisha is confident. The servant saw the horses, the chariots and the soldiers. And Elisha saw them too. So he could understand why his servant was afraid, but Elisha also knew and understood the spiritual realities. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. The problem for the servant was he couldn't see anyone apart from the soldiers of Syria. He couldn't see anybody else with him and Elisha. Whereas Elisha understood the spiritual realities. To go again to Psalm 34, the knowledge that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And he delivers them. And we too can count on unseen realities. God often protects us in ways we don't even know have happened. Who knows how often you and I have been preserved from accident or danger because of his angels. Because God has put a wall of fire around us. Not a, not a physical, visual fire, but a spiritual fire. An unseen reality. Now, that's not an excuse, of course, to do dangerous things or, or stupid things. Remember when the devil was tempting Jesus? Go on, he said, jump off the top of the temple. God will look after you. Anyway, the psalm says he will command his angels to guard you. Well, Jesus believed that psalm. But Jesus also knew that we should not put the Lord our God to the test. We shouldn't challenge God to look after us because we do something stupid. When we need protection, then the Lord will protect us. And in ways that we may not always see. Elisha has this confident faith because he understands the spiritual realities. And today I want to encourage you to understand them too. Yes, I know some people will look at you a little bit odd if you say you believe in spiritual realities such as angels or demons. But they are real. The Bible says they are real. Our Lord Jesus said that they are real. 
And Jesus was not just a man limited to the knowledge of his day, or as some would say, bound by the superstitions of his day. Jesus was the eternal Son of God come into this world to give us truth and light. And we dismiss the idea of spiritual realities at our peril. Equally, of course, we shouldn't be over-concerned about them. Often it may be enough to know that there are demonic forces, there are angelic forces, and there is a spiritual protection over our lives. And then we will live, as Elisha did, with this confident faith. Indeed, we have it even better than Elisha. For God, the Holy Spirit, lives within us. And what does the Bible say? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And then you can add to that Jesus' prayer. Father, protect them. Like Elisha, we can grow and develop in faith and live with a, a confident faith. And therefore, secondly, as we grow in faith, as our faith in God is confident and living and vibrant, then we are able to encourage faith in those around us. So let's see how Elisha does that. And the first thing he does is he says to his servant, don't be afraid. Well, perhaps we could translate the words as, don't continue to be afraid. I mean, there was no point telling him not to be afraid, because he was. He was absolutely scared stiff. He saw the chariots, the horses, the soldiers, and he turns to Elisha and says, Oh no, Master, what on earth are we going to do? Or as the Good News Bible says, we're doomed. If you've ever seen an episode of Dad's Army, you'll know the character Private Fraser. Very pessimistic outlook. If he can find a problem, he'll find it. And if he can't, he'll make it up. In almost any situation, you're likely to hear him saying, We're doomed, Captain Mannering, we're doomed. And such was the fear in the heart of Elisha's servant. But as Elisha will teach him, there was good reason not to continue to be afraid. How often the Bible says that to us. Don't be afraid. Someone once said, maybe the reason that we do go on fearing situations and fearing what people may say or may do is because we don't fear God enough. Perhaps we are a little too quick to explain the verses that talk about the fear of the Lord and say, well, it just means we respect God. Psalm 96 says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him. Psalm 2 is interesting. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice. Wait, rejoice with trembling. I'm reminded of a couple of lines in C.S. Lewis' book, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. In that book, the lion is a majestic figure with a horrific roar. And as little Lucy prepares to meet the lion for the first time, she asks Mr. Beaver, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver replies, of course he is not safe, but he is good. Are we going to have a soft, safe, pussycat view of Christ? Or the faith that trembles before the awesome, almighty Lion of Judah? when we have a right fear of the Lord, when we stand in absolute awe of God, then we're not going to be afraid of anything else. And so, to deal with his servant's uh, fears, Elisha begins to teach him about the spiritual realities. 
Verse 16 again. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And that was not just Elisha's assurance. He wanted his servant to understand and to believe that. And so he helps his servant to understand the spiritual reality that God is surrounding them. And it's truth that gets rid of fear. Because truth nourishes faith. And so when we hear the word of God, when we accept it, when we trust the God of whom it speaks, then faith is built up. If you or I were suddenly to come face to face with a lion, well then fear would be the appropriate response. It would probably be the last response. But if, if we were at the zoo and there was a thick glass wall between us and the lion, our response might be a little more relaxed. I mean, if a lion came right up to the glass and opened its mouth wide, we might take a step back. But our response would be different. And when our faith is in God, when we know his protection, then we can face those events and those circumstances that might cause fear knowing that God is with us, knowing that nothing is beyond God and that God is faithful. It's knowing his truth that removes fear. And then Elisha prays that God would open the eyes of his servant. Now that means it's not enough just to know or to have the information. It's to grasp and understand it within our being. Now we have to take Elisha's word for it about spiritual agents. We have to believe what the scripture teaches us. But Elisha asked that his servant may be allowed to see this sphere of God's invisible agents. Which though unseen are very real. So Elisha is not praying about his servant's physical eyes. The man can see well enough. He can see the horses, the chariots, the soldiers, and he's petrified. Elisha prays that he may see and understand spiritually. He has taught him the spiritual realities. Now he prays that the eyes of his heart may be opened to understand. Paul makes a similar prayer for the Ephesian church. I pray, he says, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And if we just grasp those three, that would get us a long way. God has called us to hope, a sure and certain hope of his forgiveness, of resurrection to eternal life, of the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has blessed us with so much in Christ and longs that we may understand what he has done. And notice how God's incomparably great power is at work for us. Think for a moment of the week ahead. What can you expect is going to happen? From experience, what sort of things might take you by surprise? When might you feel weak? When might you need courage? What situation might just seem to be too much? Remember this. His incomparably great power for us who believe. At every moment and in every situation. 
Years ago, we lived in Brixham in Devon, a fishing harbour where we would see lots of boats. And I read recently that in, in years gone by, when men wanted to build a new boat, they needed, of course, a very, very strong piece of wood to be the mast. So they would go to the woods. They would look around and they would select a tree. And then they would cut down the other trees around it. So the tree they wanted was now isolated. But they didn't cut it down yet. They left it. Exposed to the wind and the rain and the ice to toughen it up until it was strong enough to face up to the storms of being the mast on a boat at sea. And it's through the battles and the testing experiences of life that our faith will mature and become stronger. That we may have faith like Elisha. And that we may be ministers of grace, able to encourage faith in those around us. May God strengthen our faith. And may we encourage others. Amen.